welcome everybody. This is Jack Miller and Stefan Swanepoel for another Friday Fireside Chat. And uh, we're, we're very enthusiastic about our, our discussion today. Welcome, Stefan. How are you doing? And uh, I believe you were in Hawaii today. Hi, Jack. Yeah. Well, I was at the offices in California a week or two ago, but yes, uh, with those closing the offices again due to the California announcement by Governor Newsom, I decided, well, if I have to be in lockdown, I might as well go sit again in my pretty place. So I, I popped over to Hawaii. So yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, welcome. And then, then I want to extend a special welcome to Sarah Rodriguez, who is joining us from the National Association of Hispanic uh, Real Estate Professionals today. And uh, you're serving as the 2020 president. And I see you've also had a very uh, extensive uh, history in service to the industry. So thank you very much for that, for your leadership. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we're delighted to have you, uh, Marissa. Calderon is, is uh, I understand, is getting off of another uh, meeting, will join us shortly, and she's our executive for the organization. So, uh, but we're delighted to have you and Marissa here. Uh, we look forward to a great conversation about uh, uh, the industry, uh, what we can do better, what we can learn, uh, and what we should know about uh, Hispanic populations and real estate and the current conditions of the State of the Union. So, uh, so, Stefan, why don't you, you, you uh, have some questions that we've queued up and some conversation that, to kick off. So why don't you take us there and we'll join Marissa and when she gets here. I'm going to spend a few seconds just, uh, Jack and I have been doing these uh, Friday Fireside uh, informal, really informal, uh, in many cases also unrehearsed. These are not prepared questions. We want to try and have a very open and frank and, and caring discussion with leaders of our industry. And uh, for the first couple of weeks, we had requested we would focus on a large real estate brokerage companies. So we had some CEOs and presidents from large brokerage companies. And then uh, we felt over the summer it was important to focus on diversity. So uh, Jack and I decided we were going to dedicate the month of July and try and seek out leaders um, in our industry that serve in, in different roles and different capacities and different organizations and touch many aspects of our industry that I think a broad section of our industry might not be aware of, might not always be up to date with. So this is, is very much an exploratory journey for, for uh, the listeners on the call today, uh, but as well as for Jack and myself to try and, and learn more about the different organizations that serve many of the minority groups in our country, because we think that they have a very important message to share. So Sarah, I, I could kick off anywhere. I have no, no specific question, but if I could start, could you tell me more about Nahareb and, and what they stand for and what they do and what their goals are? And I'm passionate about these things, so excuse my excitement, but, but tell me something. <laughs> tell, tell everybody more about, about the organization. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, Stefan and I, like he said, had a delightful conversation yesterday, so he knows that I'm equally as passionate about the um, subject as well, uh, plus, you know, a little touch of being Puerto Rican, um, so a Latina that is already passionate about life and everything that has to do with my culture and my people. So NARIP is an organization that is 20 years young. Um, we celebrated our 20th year anniversary in March. Um, and it was the, the dream of our CEO and co-founder, Gary Acosta and Ernie Reyes, um, to do something, to be the voice of Latinos in the housing uh, area. Because there's a lot of Latino groups out there that advocate for different areas but there were none that truly were able to put together all of these different um, groups of Latinos so that we could put our voice together and really make sure that we were advancing uh, Hispanic home ownership. Um, if you know anything about Latinos is that our home is our castle. It's not just an asset. It is where we raise our, our children. It is, it is something that has to do, it, it means our success in life, right? That's how we measure our success when we come to this country. And we were seeing that there was a lot of, um, you know, Hispanic home buyers that didn't understand the way that um, when they came into this country that a loan was taken out or what they needed to do to qualify for it or about credit scores. So NARIP has always served um, in the space of empowering the real estate professionals so that they can in further empower their communities. We felt that our secret sweet spot 
was being able to talk to those professionals that are going to go out there and serve our communities. So we focus on education for the real estate professionals. We focus on advocacy. And then I think that is one of the calls that Marissa is on. We've been, as you can imagine, um, with everything that is going on uh, right now with COVID-19, the Hispanic community and a lot of the Hispanic small businesses have been deeply impacted um, with the closure. So we have been extremely involved with Congress on uh, trying to make sure that our Latino business people are taking advantage of the programs, they understand what it's about, and that they're that, that we're advocating for for education for them. And we also uh, work on being a stakeholder or bringing all the stakeholders together so that they are aware of what the needs of the Hispanic community are. So this is definitely our sweet spot, trying to talk to some of the brokerages, some of the lenders, some of the uh, people out there and, and bringing a voice or a diverse point of view um, that can bring a win-win for all of us. Well, I was, yes, you said, we, we chatted yesterday and I was super impressed with you because we were talking amongst many other things, the, the difficulties sometimes that many people have in their search for role models and, and, we all want to look up to somebody. We want somebody to be our mentor and guide us and show us. And, 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 I, and you, as we spoke, we, of course, you're, you're a minority on a few levels. And I'm going to raise, I'm going to raise the point and make the point that, that you're a minority because you've been so successful. And, and I think you would be a fantastic role model for thousands of people in our industry. You're a woman and, and, and you, you've achieved the highest level of success. So that already is fantastic. You're, you're Latino, minority group, you're an immigrant, yet you've, you've, you're president at the moment of the association, you have your own company, and you have a, a, a law degree, a legal degree, so you're well qualified, your own business, CEO and president of the association. I think, I think there are going to be thousands of people that want you as their role model. How did you do well, that? Have you, haven't you had, you've probably had many challenges in your life. Well, I, I appreciate that, Stefan, and, and let's, let's take a step back. So, you know, um, Jack was saying that he looked at my resume and um, I've, I've done a lot of work with, uh, with organizations, right? I volunteer a lot. What, what a lot of people don't realize is that I'm a military wife. Um, so, you know, my husband travels and I have three young boys who are very vibrant. I run a company and, um, and I still take out of my time to volunteer because as the national president of NAREP, where we have over 60,000 members. And before COVID, I used to travel all across the country um, to speak to others. Um, I still take time and it's because of what we spoke about. So when you're looking at, um, you know, a lot of the times I hear with, uh, you know, Hispanic community that there's no role models out there. There's nobody that I can model. That's why it's so exciting when we see a movie with people that look like us or sound like us or act like us. Um, and you think about it, there are some great role models kind of like in that middle tier level. But let's talk about when you think of a millionaire or you think of a top 100 fortune CEO, who do you think of? Do you think of women? Do you think of Latinos? Do you think of minorities? There's none that are there, yet there's so many people that are well qualified for that, but we have a gap on getting them to that level. So I think that there's a spot where we can come in and, and, and start mentoring. Because even if I can mentor, even if Marissa and we're mentoring those that are below us, there's still a gap between where I am at and where we could be with additional mentorship so that we could open the window and the road to others to say, oh, maybe I could be a Fortune 500 CEO one day, even if I'm coming from, you know, you know, San Juan, Puerto Rico, or, you know, Cuba, or Dominican Republic, or anywhere else, because the sky is the limit. And Jack, I'm sure you noticed that Marissa just joined us, and maybe you want to do a quick welcome and a quick introduction for Marissa? Yeah, I did. Marissa, welcome. We're delighted to have you here today. And uh, uh, Marissa Calderon is the uh, executive director for the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. And uh, thank you so much for being part of the conversation and, uh, and joining us today. We think it's an important one. So uh, again, welcome. 
Yeah, thank you for having me. I think in the in the age of, of Zoom, you can do multiple things on the same day, but you can't control other people's technology. So <laughs> I, I appreciate being part of the conversation. Yeah, and it's tough to be on two Zoom calls at the same time, right? Well, yes, definitely. <laughs> Jack, when Sarah was talking about, yeah, I, I mentioned some of the stuff which impressed me, which she was doing, and then she went and 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 even even made it more wonderful by saying and she's a military mom, and she's a mother, and she's got three kids. And I thought, boy, she's the kind of person that we like to hire, right, Jack? One of those the people world, that- The world had better out. watch out. The world better yeah. watch out they because Sarah's on the stage. And they make it look easy. And they oh. make it look easy. <laughs> Just awesome. It, Just is, awesome. it is not easy. And actually, you know, it's funny. Um, when I do mentor a lot of women, and Marissa as well, she knows this. We, we have this conversation all the time. Marissa, we're talking about mentoring, um, mm. how far we take it so seriously to mentor others. Um, it, it's funny when you, when you say that, because as women, we always have this thing where we think we have to do it all and look good and make it look easy. And one of the things um, Marissa actually brought, I want to say it was four or five years ago, an event to our convention uh, called the Latina Brunch. And in the Latina Brunch, it is a space, now everybody's welcomed, but it is a space where we actually get to recognize and um, interview uh, Latina women entrepreneurs so that we can start creating those role models. And one of the things um, when I do the panels there that I always tell people is, you know, it's okay to not be pretty all the time. It's okay to get help. It's okay to not make it look easy. But what you, what you need to know is that that hustle and that drive that we have inside of us like you need to keep pushing forward because you're not doing it just for your kids. You're doing it for an entire generation. When you're talking about diverse role models, we are, we are really being groundbreaking because there's not enough of us. There's not a lot of, you know, true, really high up role models that are Latino or they're I minority. So when you feel like you've got him kicked in the belly or <laughs> when things are not going a hundred percent, you got to know what your why is and who you're fighting for. And I think that's what gives you the energy and kind of like that sass to keep going. Yeah, I mean, I also think there's, there's, um, there's an approach that I know that, um, that Sarah feels, because I've learned this from her, that um, as, a, as a woman and as a Latina, um, I, I don't view the um, mentorship conversation or, or even the competitive landscape as a zero sum equation. Um, I think that um, there's, there's enough opportunity for all of us. It's an and, not an or. And, and sometimes that's not the case when, you know, for our male counterparts, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a dog eat dog approach. So um, I think that because we do view things, you know, through our you know, perspective lens, that it isn't a zero sum game. It's, it's about lifting one another up and providing opportunity. Because, you know, my perspective is certainly for those that I mentor is when they succeed, that's my success because um, I help them to be a better them. And, and if they do well um, and they shine, then there's probably something I can learn from them as well for personal growth. I like that sentence. I help them to be a better them. It's, that's a nice, nice way of putting it. Nice way of putting it. Could you guys share with us a little bit? I was reading and I have not read everything, but I, I, did, I did page through the 2019 Hispanic Home Ownership Report, which was pretty comprehensive. And, and I like numbers, so I remember some of the numbers that the Hispanic was the fastest growing group, the most significant growing group. And if I remember correctly, the last, I'm not sure, is it, is it year or 10 years, you were something like 53 or 59% of the total. It was, it was more than half. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's um, almost 52%. So 51.6% of the net homeownership growth in the country has come from the Latino community. So that should in some ways give us pause because we're talking about 18% of our population, uh, which by the way, more than 60% of the Latino population are millennials or younger. So when you think about the actual uh, segment of that 18% that is able to purchase a home of age and has the means to do so, it's disproportionately um, you know, accomplished in terms of hitting that home ownership target. Hugely disproportionate, because if I round your numbers off, if I may, about 20% of the population is responsible for about half of, of the growth. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, Jack, there's an opportunity right there for, for yes. all agents. 
it's it's one of these ones I, we had this last week on the call we had as well where it's kind of like the real estate industry is missing a, a huge opportunity no. because of the growth in, in in the market and i think the uh you know it, it is the desire to establish the household the desire to establish that it's fundamental it's part of real estate is a gateway to the american dream it's it's part of it and you know and i think we're not paying attention to a group of people that is really actively participating in it and will participate for decades and decades. So yeah, yeah, uh, earlier on- And that's call, a great point. Sorry, Stefan, that's a great point um, that you're making is, is not only the numbers that we have right now, it's the numbers that we have been having and that we will have. I mean, Latinos have been consistently uh, increasing their home ownership numbers throughout the last five years, whereas other demographics have either stagnated or even gone a little bit down, right, Marissa? That's right. I mean, so for, um, you know, for, for most of, um, of the different demographic or racial segments, it has been exactly what um, Sarah mentioned, that there's been either a flattening or, you know, if you look at um, the biggest uh, component of our overall U.S. population, non-Hispanic whites, it's been um, dramatically decreasing. And so, you know, what, what we have found is that for, for most folks who aren't themselves Latino, um, there's a, a little bit of intimidation factor of how do I approach this segment um, and is it a Spanish language only segment? And, and the answer is no, it's not. You know, um, majority of the U.S. population is, of the U.S. Latino population is U.S. born. They're, they're not immigrants. And so um, Spanish language fluency is not a requirement. It's a, there, there's a cultural connective tissue though um, that Spanish is part of um, that can certainly help to make you more successful and to make you more connected in with that segment. And I think that um, Sarah with her experience is a great example of how it's an extreme benefit and it can propel you to even more success. And so it's certainly not prohibitive if you don't speak Spanish, but it sure is going to help you, you know, because there's some person in, in that equation that speaks that language and really wants for you to be able to connect with some of the cultural nuance um, that's part of them as a human. I, I can absolutely 100% relate to that, that whether, whether, you're, whether you're an immigrant or of a minority race group or you're a female, or, or you speak a certain language, you do relate a little bit more to somebody else that is of that group or standing or position or background. And there is maybe a slightly higher level of comfort level, but I've bought two or three homes since I immigrated to the States. And although I have a higher comfort level with people which would be of that, that's called it the same group, I didn't buy from that, that group. I bought from the agent that, that gave me the best service, the person who was in the right area, the person who had the listing, the person that knocked on my door twice, the guy that followed up or the lady that followed up. And at the end of the day, I didn't even care whether my agent was Hispanic or not Hispanic, immigrant or not immigrant, or male or female. I wanted, I wanted the best, best service I could get. So I think we should step up um, and seize that opportunity. All of us, all of us. Oh. But I think that, you know, I 100% I agree with you. And I have seen that uh, throughout the Hispanic population that they don't necessarily specifically need somebody that speaks their language. But why not be able to give them that opportunity to get great service plus somebody that can um, speak their language because it gives them a very different uh, level of comfort. I can tell you, you know, just like Jack said, I'm a, I own a title company. And um, I used to, I was telling them that I used to be an immigration attorney before I went into title. And because my husband traveled a lot um, and I got so many clients who would come to me and would say, you know, I just purchased a home. I have no idea what I signed. I, I, I don't even know what these numbers mean. Can you explain them to me? So they might have received a great service, you know, everything perfect, but, but that level of understanding, that level of culture of of acknowledging how they, how they look at things, um, of, of that cultural competency. Um, we should be able to have that and to give to our Latino population. Like we should be able to give them everything that they want because we have people out there that can give that kind of a service. If they just knew um, you know, where to be able to, to give that, right? 
They, they, they often say that the white non-Hispanic people don't enter real estate by first choice. It's not, a, it's not like a medical doctor or a lawyer or engineer, and they maybe default into it often, very often, as a second career or maybe during the course of their life or maybe if they move a lot around. Is that true of the Hispanic Latino community as well? Do they see real estate as a potential career or do we need to do more to encourage them to enter our industry as a professional? I mean, I think that uh, definitely there needs to be done um, a more effort to encourage Latinos to come into the real estate industry. Those that are in it, though, it's been my experience that, um, that it, it's, a, it's a choice because there isn't opportunity elsewhere um, that they are aware of that is a good career opportunity. And, um, and that's true also of financial services um, and, and kind of that element of our industry. That was certainly true for me. Um, I didn't know anyone in my um, personal circle who was in financial services and I kind of accidentally happened into it um, and, and I encourage others and mentor others. And the same was true for, for real estate for me. That's not, you know, for, for real estate agents who are most successful that are Latino, oftentimes it's because there just wasn't an opportunity elsewhere um, that could provide them the kind of, of life and a path to success that real estate can. Because for the most part, you know, you can accomplish what you want. It just is gonna take a lot of hard work. And, and one thing that is absolutely true about um, most Latinos is we're ready for the challenge of hard work because we want to be able to earn our way into success. That's for those that immigrated here recently or that immigration is part of their family story. That's why they came to this country because there was an opportunity here for them that didn't exist in their home country. And they're, they're ready for the, the work that comes with that opportunity. You know, Stefan, it's actually pretty interesting in my experience, um, just like uh, Marissa said, it's, it's not maybe necessarily a second um, option for them, but we see that a lot of the Latinos that are in the real estate industry were brought in by somebody else uh -huh. without a fault. Like when I ask people, I'm like, well, how did you get into real estate? Well, my uncle or my cousin, you know, became a real estate agent and they brought me in or they knew because it was one of those opportunities that um, it doesn't, you, you don't have a cap. You can be as successful as you want to. So in the Hispanic community, by and large, um, compared to different demographics, I see that it has to do with, you know, bringing people in. So it's word of mouth. Um, and also the mentorship. Um, interestingly enough, I know that a lot of us, you know, through NARIB, we've been putting a lot of um, pressure and just, you know, efforts into making sure that the real estate professionals that we have currently are out there actively trying to recruit uh, younger people to get into the arena so that, that we can mirror the population, you know, the real estate professionals can mirror the population that we are serving. So there is definitely a need um, to do more, um, but I think that that's why you see such a disparity between other demographics and Latinos getting into the real estate services because up till now, it's just been word of mouth and somebody actively recruiting them and talking to them. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that popped up here, I see in the chat board, I was trying to read at the same time, multitasking here. I see that Drew said, I'd love to bring a Latino member, Spanish speaking and or bilingual onto my team. This person wouldn't need to be in real estate already today. Where would be a good place for me to go and find such a person? Well, you could come to NARAP. <laughs> um, so, um, we know certainly there's a lot of statistics that show that um, successful individuals in general, and this is more so for Latinos, are um, well-networked individuals. So organizations like NARAP are a great place to meet individuals um, that are experienced as well as new to the industry um, and who are exactly the sort of person that you're looking for to help you grow your team, to grow your, your brokerage, your business, whatever the case may be. And I'm gonna raise you one. I'm going to say, um, you know, cause we're always looking to expand um, our demographic, right? Like if we look and see what is the demographic of realtors, versus the population, we also need to be actively seeking out younger people to come into our industry. So I've always thought, um, you know, when you look at some brokerages or some financial institutions that go to college campuses, 
to try to recruit people into the financial services, I always feel like that's a little bit of a missed mark because, you know, then you're, you're definitely, you know, who are the people that are there that are going to be, you know, interested in this. So I always say, why not go into the high schools? Why not go into certain pockets? You know, you think high school is young, but these are 17 and 18 year olds that might not have the money to go to college or might not have the, the means or, you know, they have to start working because they have to help their families and would be a true asset to your team because they understand the culture. They're, they're probably fully bilingual and they have that hunger to want to make a name for themselves and, and would be a, a great asset to somebody's team right now. So I encourage you to look a little further to see what can be a win-win situation in your community. You know, I've always thought of not only trying to recruit somebody for my team, that would be great, but also where is a pocket of the population where I can mentor somebody and make a change in their life? And then you know that you are not only helping yourself, but you're helping the community. And that community is going to be very grateful that you've gone that extra step to try to mentor them into something like this. Jack, you're always ready to take on some nice big tasks when I hand them over to you. So I think yes, what sir, Sarah, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what Sarah's now said, I think sounds so logical, and I'm sure it's twice as hard as what it sounds. But why don't we put on our back burner that we explore some ideas if we could come up with some idea or a project or something, maybe we could work with them and somebody else. How do we get the word out to maybe more schools in some fashion? I know there are many schools. I know it's complicated, but that's the task. Let's think how we can in 2021 reach out to multiple schools across the country, even if it's not everybody yet, and try and get the word about becoming a real estate professional on their radar, at least as an option. And Stefan, I'm going to tell you, because sometimes I know when, when we work here with some groups um, to try to get this done, that it's a little bit intimidating, right? Because you're like, well, I'm just hiring my first Spanish speaking person and now you want me to train them from the get go. Well, like Marissa said, there is a great organizations like NARIP that are built around mentoring and educating these real estate professionals. So we help you make sure that these real estate professionals have the utmost, um, you know, up-to-date, innovative training in our industry to be able to service our community because that's what we're all about. We're, we're an organization that truly wants to empower these, um, you know, real estate professionals. So, because if I empower 60,000 real estate professionals, imagine how many people those 60,000 real estate professionals can touch more than we alone can as an organization. Absolutely. So it's, and you're gonna be impacting a community that needs it for the good. So what, what more of a win-win is that? Yep, yep, Jack? Yeah, no, I just wanted to, I mean, you guys have some excellent materials. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the 10, the 10 steps and the 10 disciplines uh, years ago. Our wealth project. It's so good, guys, it's so good. It's one where I'm like, Gosh, we should just be teaching this to everybody, you know? Because it's so good. We don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. Like yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Like what I'm telling you about the college students and the high school students. Um, you know, NARIP has partnered with Latitude, um, which is a, a, a different thing, but it's also about Latino uh, economic upper mobility. And we actually give free tickets to these amazing events to high school and college students for them to start learning the language and to start thinking, because it's not just about me saying something pretty for you guys. It's about, you know, we truly work to, to impact our community so that in 10 years, you know, we can create that legacy and we can look back and say, you know, in 10 years, oh my God, Stefan, you remember when we were talking about this and we, we made a difference. We made a difference. <laughs> There's nothing better than that. There is nothing better than that when a person calls you years later and said, oh my God, you changed my life. Like that's the best thing in the and, world. Yeah, and when, when you impacted them, at, as, as Sarah said, Marissa said, maybe 16, 17, 18, 19, and they potentially 
could have done nothing with their life or they could have potentially maybe fallen into you know bad habits or bad patterns and you were able to shift them on a path where five or 10 or 15 or 20 years later they have a home or they have a, a successful career and you go like I really, really, really made a difference, right? It's, I mean, it's that warm, that warm, fuzzy feeling, which I think so many of us, maybe, maybe because I'm the guy with gray hair here, as you get older, you have a burning, a grower, a bigger desire. I mean, everybody has a desire to do that, but maybe, maybe even a more bigger desire because you know that you don't have many years left, so you want to do something that's meaningful. Um, I, I would want to do two comments here. I was reading one here from one of our own staff members, Chris Riley, and he actually said, he said, uh, Jack, while the schools are now very much online, maybe this is a technology initiative. Maybe we can we can That's work with Maharep and the Asian Association, the African American, and NAR, and figure out how we can come up with a tech play that can introduce these associations. Because I know going around to every school, of course, Marista doesn't have the time. I don't have the time to go to all these schools. It's an impossible task. Mm -hmm. So you can maybe do a few, but if you could do something online, that might be a early foot in the door, early foot in the door? Yeah, I mean, so we actually are, are beginning, um, I, I would say a cultural competency process um, online. Um, we are an, engaging in a partnership with Arizona State University for exactly the reason that you mentioned. Um, there's, um, they are aligned with an organization called InStride that provides online content and when we're working with them on um, cultural competency content that is, I would say, directed at, at people who are outside of high school um, but certainly maybe something uh, of that nature could be tailored toward that younger population like Sarah mentioned, uh, because you're, you're right, we're, we're all sort of stuck indoors right now. And, and when you think about the Latino community, you're talking about a bunch of digital natives who are already accustomed to Perfect. consuming content. Yeah. Exactly. And, and one thing I wanted to say about the NAREP 10 um, is that that whole wealth project initiative was really born out of the last recession where we learned the hard way because Latinos lost two thirds of their household wealth that um, you, you can't uh, kind of put all your eggs in one basket. And that's what the case was for folks who, uh, who were homeowners there. And so those NAREP 10 disciplines were really um, built from that. They were born from that experience so that we could learn to do better and different in the future. And a lot of our members are really, you know, they've leaned into those concepts and they're relying on, on the fact that they've implemented those principles over this period of time so that they aren't as, um, you know, adversely impacted during this pandemic. Well, Marissa, I'm going to throw another one at you here because, again, I was reading the, the chat here. We're getting an enormous amount of chat. This one came from Rick Haas, and he's president of United Real Estate. We met Rick many years ago when he was uh, president of Ladder and Bloom. So he was with a large real estate company, and then he moved to, again, another large real estate company, slightly different uh, business model. But they have, I don't remember from the top of my head, but thousands of agents. So a big company, and he's saying, I would like to have Nahareb have a higher profile exposure within our company. Please tell me how I can make that happen. So there we go. There's an opportunity for you. How can, how can you make that happen so that he has a better exposure? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that we would love to you know, welcome any and all participants in this space into the organization. And, and that can mean lots of things, depending on where you're located. It can mean uh, from a very grassroots perspective, getting involved with your local chapter, which by the way, I'm, I'm sure that, um, that Sarah mentioned that we've got 85 chapters across the country that are incredibly active right now from a content and connected perspective with their members. So the, um, the, the best way for, for them to get involved is to actually join um, and to, to begin to form some of those relationships on the ground in their local chapter markets where business is actually transacted. Um, on the, the national level, I'd love to have a conversation with anyone who would like to be able to get more involved from a company perspective, because there's a lot of value, you know, beyond just attending an event, whether it's mm -hmm. virtual or in person, there's a tremendous amount of business value and education that we provide to our partners, because again, their success is our success. If the companies that are aligned with our mission are getting something from an ROI perspective back, then they're doing something that's positive for the consumer and for the professional community. And, and that benefits us. And we see a very real uh, connectedness in that. Well, Rick has already responded. He's already said here, thank you. And he said, FYI, Stefan, we have 9,000 agents in 32 states, right? It's a little bit of a punt there. So uh, Rick, this is a shout out to you to say you have an obligation now to call Marissa 
And if you don't have her email, just ping me and I will send you Marissa's email, reach out to her and she will see how she can work with you. I'm also gonna respond quickly to a question which I see Sarah's already answered, but I think it would be good if she answered it for everybody's sake. The question came from Denise who said, do you have to be of Latino descent to join the Harem? Sarah? No, ab absolutely not. We accept everybody. You just want to be, you, uh, the only requirement is that you have to have, you know, a good sense of humor, um, <laughs> like to have fun, and you want to know about the Hispanic community. So m all of our events are in English. Um, we do, like we said, we want to make sure that we're all inclusive because we're all about empowering the real estate professionals and making sure that they understand the cultural uh, competency. Um, it's all about training. Uh, and, and again, just training with the same loss and everything that you guys are used to, but understanding those certain differences on how to treat our uh, demographic in order to make them feel comfortable and get them educated to where they need to be. So you can look for a chapter that is near you. Um, I think that they've put uh, you know, the website down there and we'd love to welcome you all. Awesome. Jack, some more questions or thoughts from your side? So I, you know, I, I'm super enthusiastic about this conversation. Stefan's given us a, a, a charter to go do something about it. Um, and I, I just wanted to know what, what do you think, you know, we can do national education, we can do, uh, you know, we can do outreach. Um, how, what are the initiatives that you already have in play that people should be aware of today? Are there any, any things that, that this audience, you know, that, that really should take away from this conversation? They've gotten the join, the join message for sure. And I think that's, I've gotten it personally. So I'm excited about that. But are there any things that are happening that you're engaged in advocacy or that, that are happening right now that are current that we should know about? Um, yes, I would say that NARP is incredibly active from an advocate, advocacy perspective. So we, we sort of exist in the space, if you think of, of Latino um, advocacy and housing advocacy as a you know, Venn diagram, we exist in the middle space. Um, so we're very good about staying in our lane. Um, you know, uh, things that are of a civil rights nature are, are someone else's good work. That's not good work that we focus on. Um, uh, you know, part of, of what we do is work um, certainly at the federal level. You know, things like the disparate impact um, rule are important to us, and we appreciate industry um, backing on making sure that those sorts of things, you know, are, are certainly not changed in a way that impacts consumers' ability to become homeowners. And we also get engaged uh, more recently at the state and local levels um, from an advocacy perspective on issues like inventory. Um, in California, which is sort of ground zero for that, we're very active there. Um, and, and I would say aside from advocacy, which is, is critically important because it's sort of uh, the, the framework around how we can earn our, our, you know, our money and do our business, um, there's uh, the nuance that Sarah spoke about from a um, kind of a, a marketing perspective. We have a, um, a consulting um, arm of our business that provides um, insights through things like Humda analysis and, and provides that um, cultural um, you know, insight into you know, how you can uh, shift some of the strategy within your business. So it's sort of a more surgical approach than, uh, than the... Um, association uh, related yeah. networking. Um, mm -hmm. but there, there is that kind of data driven analysis to your business uh, layered with the Latino consumer elements that can help business to, to shift and to be more successful in this space in particular. So, so there's a way for organizations or companies to raise their hand and say, I'd like a little extra help or I need, I need can somebody provide me some insights that would be specific to me? There is. I mean, so there is, for example, a, um, a, a Hispanic market analysis that we produce that has the, the top 10 Latino markets across the country, and we provide data with respect to um, language competency, nativity, of, uh, if there is a predominance of Spanish speakers in that market, from where? Are they from Mexico? Are they from some Central, Central American country? So that if you're going to produce in-language content, you do it with the right dialect. Um, mm -hmm. What does the employment look like for the individuals who are Latino in that market? Um, are they predominantly um, in certain segments of um, different industries so that when you are targeting those consumers, you're doing it, you're, you're speaking to the right population. You're not speaking in some other area where they are not. Um, and, and that we can do, you know, layered with company specific information. So we're um, unlike other associations in our space in that 
we really look at what we do um, from this neutral space of um, of, of business and of you know kind of economic vitality, and when you address all of those triggers, um, then you're able to accomplish great things. It's almost a kind of a partnership. It is. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I really, I really appreciate you sharing that. I did not know that that was even a thing. So that's <laughs> terrific to yeah. know that there's there's like more. If you're running a, a large company organization, there's a way to there's a way to do more and uh, mm -hmm. to really put it into action. So that's. To, to make sure that that the the discussions which we've had this month, which we've just started with, um, doesn't drop off the table. Uh, we at T3 have committed that we are going to hire somebody in the role of diversity. And it's not just hiring a diversity person to look politically correct. We want to hire somebody who's going to dedicate their full-time attention to saying, how does T3 work with you and other organizations and companies to actually start, I shouldn't say start because a lot has already been done. We're just gonna contribute a little piece, but how we can contribute because many of us want to do something, but we all have such a busy program that you do something and then before you notice it, you're working with another client again or you're busy with something else or you've got budgets or stuff. And then you find out, oh, the month has gone by or two months have gone by and I didn't do what I thought I would do or I could do or should do. So we're gonna dedicate one person to help us keep us on the straight and narrow and keep us consistently at the top of our attention. And we plan to make that announcement within the next 30 days. So we want to do that now, super quickly, and get that person on board in the next 30 to 45 days and make sure that we can actually, actually, and I'm going to ask if, and I know you're going to say yes, but I want that person to be able to reach out to you guys. And I am, will make sure that that person is a, a, a double minority at least. So I'm going to make sure that that person understands the issues as you do so that they can help us make sure that we understand them better as well. That's great. We'd love to be able to, you know, start that dialogue. Wonderful. I love that. Yeah. We, we, we have been, I, I think, I, well, I like what Stefan said, the issue is time and attention and focus. And I just, um, and we're, we've, our business has, has gotten to a point where we feel like it's a necessity that we staff a person who is full time on this because it's, you know, we think our clients need help too in terms of understanding your market and what you have to offer and the opportunities that are there. But I think having that liaison is really important. And, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. Stefan said more than I expected him to say today. So I'm kind of, I'm jumping up and down that we're getting to talk about it more. It's great. Uh, Jack, I'm going to predict, I'm going to predict to you that that department is not going to stay at one. I'm going to predict that we are going to double it next year and probably double it again the year after that. If, if, if we do some of the initiatives that Naharep and uh, the um, other, other associations are doing and we create our own initiative, which we've also spoken about, and we can pull them together, um, I think that that department is going to double or triple in size. They'll be busy. Yeah, they'll be busy for sure. For sure, for sure. So. Well, I'm, I'm excited that, that Sarah tongue in cheek said one of the requirements to join our association is a sense of humor. So hopefully I would call it for I, Sarah. Oh, oh, it was more than tongue in cheek. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very real requirement. <laughs> well, we will so take you in. We will adopt you all that, like I said, I mean, the only thing that you need to have is just a big heart, a sense of humor, and want to actually be able to help, um, you know, the Hispanic community. Because at the end of the day, by helping the Hispanic community, you're, we're all helping each other out as well. So we and will I, open arms. <laughs> I think that might be a, a good way to segue to a close and say, thank you very, very much for your delightful time this morning. I think that, that race and color and minority and, and women and LGBT, they're always these touchy subjects and they are very, very important. But I know that if you're not in that group or if you're in that group, you sometimes, you just don't know where to tread. It's like walking on eggshells sometimes. And I understand why it is like that, but that doesn't help us solve the problems, right? We need to be, as you said, somewhat, somewhat open-hearted, a, a good heart, a willingness to want to make a difference, a willing to want to contribute, a willing to make a difference and understand that we all come with different viewpoints. And although we do, when I spoke with you yesterday, Sarah, you said a few things and, and I, I even took a note of that. It's here on sticky on my screen because it was so important for me is you said that, that travel 
opens your mind, opens your eyes, opens your opinion, makes you more tolerable, more understanding um, to understand how different people from different religions and backgrounds and countries and cultures look at the same issues sometimes from totally opposite directions with no, no malice or no wrong intent intended, just that's the way they were raised. So, so, and yet all of us, as Jack said, all of us want to have a castle, right? You also said your home is your castle. And, and you said that today, I felt that in my heart, my wife and I've always felt that way, our home is our castle. So I think all of us from any country, any background would like to follow the American dream. And thank you very much to Nahareb and to Gary and to all of the others that have done so much for our association, for our industry. And Jack and I commit that we are going to try and contribute in the next couple of years as much as possible. Jack, a closing comment on your side, and then we'll let, let the I ladies think, I think you stole all my thunder. You, did, you <laughs> said all the good things, so I'm not even going to try to follow that. Uh, but I do, I do want to share, I think that if the audience hasn't looked, this, this 10 disciplines thing, I, lo I am in love with it. Like, I, I saw it years ago, re looking at it now. Um, I think you guys have some really powerful, culture-moving, positive stuff here that uh, people, even if, even if they weren't coming for that, they should come for this alone because it's so good. So, uh, so I'm going to share that with uh, all of the people that we interact with and, and ha hopefully spread some awareness of your organization amongst the, the clients and, and customers that we have because they should know because it's great. Let's have Marissa say a few words and then Sarah can close us out. Yeah, thanks. Well, th thanks so much for, for having us today. And, and um, one of the things that, that we talked about the other day was um, just the, the perspective that, and I can say this for myself and, and for, you know, um, most people like, like Sarah and others that are not the majority of whatever that is, that um, you're sort of uh, compelled if you want to be successful to have a wider angle lens and to understand the perspective of other uh, of other people within either your professional circle or potentially your personal circle. And that's, you know, kind of what you alluded to with, with travel. I would say that that's certainly been the case for me that, um, you know, in order for me to be able to thrive as a professional, it's that wider angle lens so that I can have context for how others like to do business. And, um, and that's um, part of the reason that so many of our members are successful. And so we, we welcome, um, you know, anyone to come into NARA know that there is that complete open arms and, and the organization's culture is one of lifting one another up and of sort of a cooperation. Um, if you can think of, of kind of pushing those two words of, of um, you know, uh, collaboration and competition together. Um, so love to be here and thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Sarah, last word. Yes, well, thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. I'm excited to see um, you know, I will tell you the one of the things that we're very proud of at NAREP is the way that we approach everything. Um, we want to just not talk the talk, we want to walk the walk. And we have done a really wonderful job at uniting all of the different Latino demographics, because we are very different within, to work together to uh, find a unified Latino voice. And the way that we've been able to do that is by being empathetic and, and learning and, and humanizing each other, right? This is what Stefan and I were talking about. There's been so many times when I'm in a position or something uh, happens and somebody says, well, well, you're not really Latino because I know you. Well, maybe that's how we start moving things. Maybe it's just by coming to our events and getting to know us and getting to know those diverse um, you know, and minority groups so that you can start understanding the prism in which they look at life and how they look at things and why they say the things that they do. Because by understanding and humanizing our, each other is how we're truly gonna be able to start understanding um, each other and start rising ourselves as, as a community. So thank you so much for having us and for giving us a space to talk about really important things. And hey, if you ever want to bring us back to talk about the top 10 uh, principles you need to follow to become a millionaire, we're also here available for you. Love it. Love it. Do that. Love it. I think we're going to do that. We are all children of the world. Thank you for your time. Thank you for everybody. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Take care. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.